correspondence, right? <laughs> so you're going to do the correspondence? Yes. I must talk about uh, okay. you know, an email that you. Are we live? Okay, so we should just go ahead. Okay, welcome everyone to this um, Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District business meeting. Um, can we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, let's first start with any correspondence. Mrs. Santos? Yes, all the correspondence was by email. Um, Barbara, Barbara Panarillo about the music department and choir merger. Thomas Rizzuto on May 17th regarding JV baseball game. Andrea Treble regarding Island Trees games. Sean O'Too regarding JV baseball athletic department proposal. Grace Serby about the budget 20. 122, and Barbara Curry regarding New York State Department of Health interim guidance for in-person learning. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to the Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Yanni. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I just uh, want to follow up uh, some of the uh, previous emails that we received. Uh, we follow up uh, regarding personnel. Um, so we will not discuss that in public, but at this time I would like to discuss an email that came from uh, Miss and Mr. Curry uh, this afternoon, I believe. Uh, the, the, the most important question is that in terms of the high school vaccination program, um, we have not um, 
we have not recruited students to be ambassadors of that program. So uh, I want to make sure that um, Ms. Curry and uh, Mr. Curry are, are aware of that. Uh, we're not part of that program. I know maybe some schools did, but we did not. Um, we have been following in terms of the Department of Health uh, uh, guidelines. We've been following the uh, guidelines, and we are uh, one of the few schools. I don't have the data in terms of how many, but we are one of the few schools who have been in session for the most part for the entire 2021 school year, and that's due to the work of our students, um, the, 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 how they comply to all the guidelines, uh, the staff, the administrators. Uh, so that is something that we have been doing since, um, you know, even before my time. We are constantly evaluating the protocols in terms of students being on with masks and um, uh, desk cards and all of that. And I just want to reiterate the fact that as of right now, there is an executive order in place which we, we have to follow by law. And that, that requires a couple of things. The first one is that there is a reopening plan in place, which we do. And if there is any change, there is going to be a committee that is going to convene. And the second piece is that the, the, the plan conforms with the Department of Health guidelines. And that guidance has not been modified based on the new CDC guidelines about the mask. So CDC came out with some uh, guidelines, but the Department of Health and didn't adopt that uh, at this point. So we are following the executive order uh, that we have to follow by law. And as, as a superintendent and the board, we don't have the authority to not follow that. So I just want to... Um, point, uh, 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 reiterate this, this couple points. And my other piece is that I just want to share with, with the community and with Mr. and Mrs. Curry that um, as we come to the end of the school year and planning for the beginning of the new school year, we will take um, all, we will follow all the guidelines. We will certainly talk to our uh, legal firm to make sure that we are in compliance and we will continue to keep the community abreast of all the information. Uh, this yes. is something that is constantly changing. Um, some schools are doing other things, but you know we are, we are following the guidelines. We have a great student body that is following the rules and we have been open for the most part of the year and that is something that we should be really proud of. So. Um, Hopefully I answer some of the questions that Ms. Curry had. Yes, thank you. Could you just explain what the um, vaccine ambassadors are for the people at home who aren't familiar with that? Some of the schools, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too familiar with the program, but some of the schools have um, required some students, and some schools become sort of a place where the vaccine can be administered. Um, but, you know, we, we discuss it with... Um, you know, internally, and you know, we are doing the testing for the high-risk athletes, but we are not, we are not in the position of, we, we didn't consider that that program be part of that program. Right, right. I think also one of the reasons is there's so many vaccines available anywhere in the community. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of um, just following up on on uh, my report. I would just, um, I would like to, to take this opportunity to thank the community from the bottom of my heart. This has been my first uh, budget uh, process, my budget season at Oyster Bay, East Norwich. So I want to thank the community for their unwavering support during this entire budget process. The budget mission has been consistent since the beginning. Um, we, um, we, we started by looking at our mission and looking at a vision and to create a budget that will effectively and efficiently promote district goals and most important, support our students. Uh, the vision of empowering all students uh, to achieve excellence is alive and we are so proud of their work every single day. Just to mention a, a, a few things, 
Uh, the other night I was at uh, Roosevelt last week and it was um, sports night at Roosevelt and it, and it was fascinating to see the parents and um, I saw a lot of dads and uh, playing with the kids in different events um, and to see the smile in their face and the joy of being together, being on the field, it, it was just really gave a sense of a family atmosphere and that's what we are very proud of. I also, hopefully you had a, uh, like me, the opportunity to see the virtual art gallery. And I wanna thank the students for their artwork um, and the teachers and the administrators for putting that together. We did not miss a beat uh, because of my staff, because of the, the, the students that we have and even with the with the musical, uh, streaming live, we kept it going even though the, sometimes the, the school doors were a little bit closed. Um, in terms of the last week, I was uh, at Vernon in the afternoon and I saw the, the wonderful artwork, right? Chalk, it was called Chalk to Talk. And everybody had a, a positive message to celebrate mental, uh, mental health awareness month. Uh, they did a great job. Uh, News 12 was here and they were impressed with the maturity of our students. I, I was not surprised at all. I want to thank uh, Dr. Vacchio uh, for always finding ways to support our students. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes in the morning I, I kind of share my time between the schools and I'm always impressed by Dr. Vecchio's remembering every student's name. I'm going to try to do that. Um, she makes me feel like I don't know anybody. She knows all of them by name, which is <laughs> impressive. So kudos to her. Um, I always say that we have the best students. I keep saying every day, every month, and the data shows that every single at every single meeting. Tonight, we're gonna give an award to uh, several awards, but one of them was a P PSAG, um, and our students got selected from a pool of 4,500 students. That's an impressive, that's an impressive thing. We had, a, we had another student got selected from a, a pool of 500 students. That, that's impressive. That's something that we should be really proud. And I say all the time, our students are the real deal. There is no doubt about it. Um, Great students usually have amazing role models, and I am very, very proud to share that the Long Island Council for Social Studies has chosen Doctors, Dr. Joseph Pasquera, K-12 Social Studies Supervisor, as, they, as their outstanding supervisor of the year. Joe, why don't you come up, come up. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Pasquera has been um, involved in the K-12 Social Studies Department, helping us with, the, uh, with, with all the transition, with the new standards, and uh, impressive work even with the town, and with the work to bring, to bring that, that curriculum, to bring a, a, a sense of reality, uh, and not just uh, topics on, 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 on the book. And we're also very fortunate to have Brian Soper, Mr. Brian Soper, uh, social studies teacher, as their high school teacher of the year. So let's give a big round of applause. <laughs> so at this point, I know we have a long agenda, so um, I will pass it to uh, Dr. Moho to read some of the names and I'll be at the podium to give some of the certificates. Okay. First of all this evening, we'd like to recognize um, Oyster Bay High School freshman Anya Kelly, who won the National Junior Honor Society's Outstanding Achievement Award. Anya is one of 500 exceptional students nationwide and one of 36 students in New York State to receive this recognition. So Anya. Yeah.
We're also proud to recognize four of our students who uh, won prizes by PSENG for the public service announcements that they created. The program held in conjunction with Earth Week empowered students in grades four through eight to make a difference by learning ways to conserve energy and protect the environment while inspiring others. So um, we'd like to recognize Skylar Posella for his PSA entitled Special Energy Unit. We also would like to recognize Abigail Rudnett for her um, PSA entitled How to Conserve Energy. And then our eighth grade students, James Catania and Jose Velasquez, worked on a PSA entitled Save Water. Cool. That was a joint project, and I don't believe he's here. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to Joseph. And now we have your credit. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to the Board of Education, Dr. Yanni, for allowing me to be here tonight to present some of our finest athletes from both the late winter and fall season this evening. Thank you for all your supp the support you've given to the athletic department, its coaches, and its athletes. The Oyster Bay Athletic Department enjoyed a terrific season of participation during the fall and winter. Even better, our fall athletes had some amazing experiences with their friends during a unique time in the history of high school sports and in our region. It was incredible seeing teams reconnect after a long delay since their 2019 seasons ended. While the seasons were shorter, experience were various and plentiful. Tonight, it is my honor and privilege to recognize our Oyster Bay High School athletes who were recognized for their achievements during both the late winter and the fall 2021 spring season through the various levels of high school sports. Before presenting the individual athletes, I'd like to recognize Oyster Bay teams that earned Scholar Athlete Team Awards from the New York State Public High School Athletic Association. These teams had a 90% or better team academic average. For the fall season, Girls cross country led the way with a 94.68 average. Girls volleyball, 94 and a half. Field hockey was 94. Girls tennis, 93.4. Girls soccer, 93.2. And boys cross country, 92.47 averages. Congratulations. I should point out that of all of our teams, the, other, the three that were not recognized missed, the, missed this mark by two points, no more than two points. So again, uh, a great example of scholar athletes at its finest here in Oyster Bay. Winter athletes that, that participated in the full version of this year's winter athletics were fencing, winter track, and wrestling. Uh, they were recognized at a board meeting earlier in the year. And tonight, we're going to recognize those basketball athletes from their abbreviated winter season that ran through the month only through the month of February and had their awards later than those that had a full season of both January and February. So when I call your name, I'd like you to please just come on up and head up to Dr. Yanni, who has a certificate of recognition uh, from the school district and the Board of Education. First season that we're going to recognize is girls basketball. All county was 11th grader Emma Kelly. Okay. 
also from the girls' basketball team, all-county honorable mention, Gabby Treble, senior. And finally, from the girls' basketball team, all-conference junior, Caitlin Kelly. From the boys' side, all-league senior, Max Weinberg. All-league freshman, Aston Pilatos. and also All-League senior, Kai Shepard. Okay, again, those are the, the uh, late winter uh, recogni recognized athletes that we had from the February season. Do you want me to do soccer as well, or just, you just want to do this basketball? Okay. For the fall season, uh, coming back up for a second time this evening, senior Gabby Treble was all-county and scholar-athlete for girls soccer. We had two all-class girls soccer, soccer players. They are Laura Castro Giovanni, Jr. And joining her with all-class honors is junior Paulina Draven. Sorry, yes, all conference. Uh, freshman, Chiara Ritigliano. Kiara, Kiara, before you move too far away, I didn't want to make you do this twice. At this time, because we have athletes from, you know, multiple waves of athletes, as I mentioned in the lobby, I'm going to ask those athletes from this first group and those uh, receiving other awards from this first group, if they could, to just exit through this side doorway. And uh, Dr. Pascara will let in the second group of athletes from the fall season. Congratulations to everybody here with this first group. Well done. Okay, the second group now coming in consists of members of the football team, field hockey team, and volleyball team. As this group makes its way inside, I, I, again, I, just a, a highlight from the year, we see some girls here in their lacrosse uniforms, uh, you know, we see some coming from practice or whatever it may be. Uh, this has been obviously a very different year when it comes to athletics with the compression of seasons. Very, very busy and uh, truly uh, a, a, a great sight to see when all these athletes are outside and, and have been committed. It's been a, uh, a heck of a marathon since the beginning of February with seasons that are, are much more condensed than they used to be, sometimes having, you know, three or four games a week. Um, to get it all in the two-month season. So congratulations to those that have come back and, and joined us again. So 
for those that are just coming in, we did introduce you know, the, the reason for being here tonight. We're recognizing our highest athletes. So now I'm going to go into football, uh, who we had one member of the team, a junior. Uh, he is all-county honorable mention and all-conference, Justin Ingebrigtsen. Okay, Justin's not here. The field hockey team was a Class C semifinalist this year and had a number of girls recognized for their outstanding efforts. First off, senior all-county honors Jen Coletti. I'm sorry, second group. Yep, when your name is called, please come up to Dr. Yanni. Okay. One of our senior standouts, Anna Silver, all-county and scholar-athlete. Anna Silver, senior, field hockey. Another senior earning honors of all-conference and the exceptional senior award, Colette Kilfoyle. <laughs> earning all-conference honors, junior Bryn Johnson. Earning all class honors, junior Megan Cox. And also from the field hockey team, earning the Unsung Hero Award, junior Megan Kelly. The last team from this second group is the, volleyball, the girls' volleyball team, uh, who enjoyed a terrific season, uh, earning the title of co-conference champions and also making it to the semifinals. Are we going? What's up here? This is, what's the next scorecard? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, girls' volleyball. We're going to delay just a moment here. Back to the girls' volleyball team. Uh, again, co-conference champions. Uh, earning all county and all tournament is junior Bridget Zaradnik. <laughs> earning all county honorable mention and also all tournament, junior Caitlin Kelly. Earning all-county honorable mention, congratulations, senior, Maya DeFiglia. <laughs> Earning all-conference, junior, Caitlin Ashheim. <laughs> Earning all-conference and the Scholar Athlete Award, senior, Skylar McAvoy. And finally, let's recognize the coach of this terrific team, Jen Isles, Conference B Co-Coach of the Year. Okay, that, that was the last group that we're recognizing during this second segment. I thank everybody for coming, making their way from their lacrosse games and all other places in the area. At this time, I'm going to ask those that were just recognized to head out the exit over here uh, to my left. To head, out, to head out, we're going to ask Dr. Pescara to bring in the third group of recognized athletes. But again, thank you for coming this evening, and congratulations on a great season.
Feel better. Congratulations. Thanks for coming. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay, so those folks making their way into the library, come on in. There's some seating over here once you get the, around the TV screen. Please join us, have a seat. Okay, this is the final group, the final round of recognized athletes from the fall 2021 spring season. Uh, that we are going to be now looking at boys cross country, girls cross country, boys soccer, and girls tennis. Uh, again, thank you to all those who are, who are attending this evening, and uh, we're going to just go right into the awards for this group. So, from the boys cross country team, which was the division champions this year, we had a county champion runner. So the first member of the boys cross country team I'd like to recognize and congratulate is senior Nick Tardunio, the Class C <laughs> county champion and also earned all county honors. And as division champions, we have three more all county recipients. Uh, joining Nick is senior Riley Keffer. <laughs> joining the group, senior Izzy Silver. And rounding out the all-county honors is senior Will Capone. The team also had an all-conference winner. That is senior Connor Wick. Okay, from the girls' cross-country side, also a successful season for these young ladies. Uh, however, we had a record breaker in the group who also earned all Long Island and all county honors. That is Greta Flanagan, who set the 5K record this year. We have three all-conference winners joining Greta. First, Naomi Gagliardi, sophomore. All-Conference, Gabriela Ortuño, senior. And senior All-Conference, Lauren Sweezy. Congratulations, girls cross country recipients. Boys soccer. We had an all county athlete and two earning all conference. Uh, first, all county, Hector Ruiz Bonilla, Jr. All conference, Grady Nessus, Sr. And joining Grady with all conference honors is another senior, John Tiberia. That's, that's the, yeah, that's it for a second. And our last team that has uh, athletes being recognized tonight, earning all conference honors, seniors, senior from the girls tennis team, Rachel Kowalski. <laughs> and
And also earning all conference this year is eighth grader Rose Lindstrom. Okay, for those of you that came in with the third group, again, thank you for coming this evening. At this time, I'm just going to ask these uh, audience members if they can just head out to the main lobby. They're welcome to stay for the board meeting if they'd like, uh, but at this point, that concludes our athletic recognition. So thank you again. Congratulations. Dr. Pascara, uh, we are like, at this point, we'll invite Dr. Pascara to present the Social Studies Department update. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yanni. It's a tough act to follow there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Yanni, Dr. Mulhall, Mr. Cipriani. And thank you to the members of Board of Education for allowing me to present here tonight. The last time I presented to the board was February 11, 2020, a mere month before our lives changed drastically. While everything around us may have changed, our commitment to a strong, comprehensive K-12 social studies curriculum in the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District has remained a constant. Tonight, I will discuss the past and the future our advanced placement opportunities, and an exciting new curriculum initiative we have undertaken. We will also hear from some of our upperclassmen regarding their social studies experiences at Oyster Bay. If you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I will also field any questions you may have at the end of the presentation. It's hard to believe that this July marks five years since I became, began my time at Oyster Bay. As I stand here tonight, I am proud of what the social studies program has accomplished, but I'm even more excited about what the future holds. I thought it would be appropriate to begin by looking at where we were five years ago, where we are today, and where we hope to be within the next five years. In 2016, when I arrived at Oyster Bay, my first initiative was to do a full audit of the K-12 social studies curriculum. I found very passionate social studies teachers who needed support shifting from the old New York State core curriculum to the new New York State Social Studies K-12 framework. Today, we are 100% aligned to the New York State K-12 Social Studies framework with a deeper focus on historical thinking skills, something which, which Ms. Harris will talk about later on in this uh, presentation. In the future, we'd like to continue to develop our partnerships with the Oyster Bay Historical Society and Raynham Hall to embed local history into our curriculum. This year, I have been fortunate enough to have monthly meetings with Ms. Denise Shepard at the Oyster Bay Historical Society and Ms. Claire Bellagio at Raynham Hall to discuss all of the ideas for our program. Their commitment to providing resources to help support our learners and promote local history is both inspiring and appreciated. It is one of the many reasons Oyster Bay is special. I am truly proud of how much our teachers have reflected upon their teaching of social studies over the past few years and have come to recognize the importance of inquiry-based learning um, in the social studies classroom. When I came to Oyster Bay, I saw the beginnings of great work associated with inquiry-based learning and the C3 inquiries. Teachers have done an excellent job running with this initiative and making the inquiry the cornerstone. Sorry, my mask is a little bit uh, difficult still. Um, sorry, cornerstone of student social studies experiences. As we continue on this journey, I'd like to work with our high school teachers to implement more inquiry-based learning into their classrooms, specifically those that terminate in AP and Regents exams. 
As is the case with all classes that terminate in exams, time is always a concern. In terms of AP results, I believe that we have made vast improvements over the past five years. In 2016, 36.7% of exams taken in AP social studies classes, that's world, US, government, and psychology, resulted in a three or above. In 2020, that, presented, that percentage increased to 68.5%. Over the next three years, the goal is to raise that to 75%. To reach this goal, we will ensure that we are up to date on all the changes from College Board, attend the AP-sponsored summer institutes when necessary, attend regional workshops, and continue to maintain a commitment to our collegial groups. Oyster Bay has always performed well on social studies regents exams. While many districts chose to wait when New York State announced the regents exams would be changing, beginning with the 2019 June administration, the social studies department at Oyster Bay chose to go full steam ahead and embrace the changes. Our global and US teachers attended workshops and accumulated resources online to ensure they were prepared for the shift. Furthermore, our social studies teachers became regional leaders and shared their uh, expertise with other districts at conferences and workshops. By the time the exam was administered for the first time in June of 2019, our students were prepared and the transition was seamless. In the first administration of the new Global II exam, 94% 90, of our students passed and 42% achieved mastery. The goal moving forward is to increase our mastery rates. Um, and uh, while our passing percentage is in the 90% range, the goal is definitely to ensure we increase the mastery rate. AP Social Studies courses at Oyster Bay High School are all about opportunity. We are proud that three of the four most highly enrolled in AP courses are in the Social Studies Department. We will continue to add more AP courses where we believe there is a need moving forward. For the 2021-22 school year, we will be adding AP Human Geography for interested ninth and 10th grade students. We will also continue to discuss the feasibility of new AP programs for the future. Finally, we will continue to work to develop supports to ensure all of our students are successful in AP level classes. Over the past couple of years, New York State has initiated changes to their educational system that includes a focus on culturally responsive sustaining education. The four principles of culturally responsive sustaining education include a welcoming and affirming environment, high expectations and rigorous instruction, inclusive curriculum and assessment, and ongoing professional learning. We have continued to reflect upon and modify our curriculum to ensure it adheres to the four principles of culturally responsive sustaining education that New York State has focused on. I have been lucky enough to be in a place surrounded by history and historians who love to support their local district. Over the past five years, I have relied heavily on the Oyster Bay Historical Society, Raynham Hall, and Sagamore Hill time and time again. During the summer of 2020, we began to discuss modifying our curriculum to have a focus on local history, as well as to align to the social justice standards. I have had the opportunity to work closely with Ms. Shepard from the Oyster Bay Historical Society and Ms. Bellagio from Raynham Hall to add local history to the socialized curriculum at Oyster Bay. While this process is ongoing, I am excited about what we have been able to accomplish so far and I look forward to completing this project during the summer of 2021. Here to speak more about this is Keegan Harris, a first year social studies teacher at Oyster Bay High School who has been working with Ms. Shepard and Ms. Bellagio to create lesson plans with an infusion of local history. Ms. Harris? I'm a little shorter, here we go. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share my work with all of you. My name is Keegan Harris, and while this is my first year here at Oyster Bay, it's actually my 12th year teaching social studies. Culturally responsive teaching has always been at the forefront of my pedagogy, as one of my inspirations uh, was a man named Paulo Freire, who was actually a pioneer in the field. So when Dr. Pascara asked me to create this new unit that can be taught at any grade level, I was happy to accept the challenge. Thank you. 
One of the most important elements of my job is to teach students how to interpret information and think critically and analytically about the past. History is a story of the past constructed from evidence that's found in sources. Understanding how to interpret primary and secondary source documents is the key to developing these critical thinking skills. In fact, as Dr. Pascara had mentioned earlier, it's at the core of the New York State curriculum. Interpreting historical in documents, excuse me, will also help to foster skills that students can utilize in their daily life in order to evaluate the deluge of information that they are constantly being bombarded with. Thank you, Dr. Pascara. In this unit, students will be asked to become apprentice historians and follow the story of a slave from Oyster Bay, New York, named Elizabeth, and a man from the family that enslaved her, Robert Townsend. The tale is told through the voice of the local historian who uncovered it, Claire Beller Joe. The remarkable story covers not only the dark history of slavery on Long Island, but also the individuals who worked to eventually abolish it, like Robert Townsend. Townsend is best known for being one of George Washington's spies in the Culper Spy Ring. However, few know about his work in the New York Manumission Society, a group established by John Jay and Alexander Hamilton that fought to abolish slavery in New York. As the students learn about the story, they will be able to analyze, close read, contextualize, and corroborate many of the documents that Ms. Beller Joe uncovered in order to understand how historians make claims and draw conclusions. Some of these documents include runaway slave advertisements from local newspapers. You see one of those right up there on the screen. Um, Culper spiring letters on the left-hand side and meeting minutes from the New York Manumission Society. Through these activities, students will learn to think critically and analytically about the sources they read, while also learning the remarkable history of their own local community. This unit employs two different elements of culturally responsive teaching. The first is ensuring that lessons and materials bring light to the stories of, and voices of people from all different backgrounds. And the second is allowing students to play an active role in their own learning instead of being passive recipients of knowledge something that Paulo Freire actually coined as the banking model of education, where teachers simply just deposit information into their students' brains. Once again, I'd like to thank all of you for the chance to speak this evening. I am really looking forward to teaching this in September in the next school year, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris. We are excited to continue this work and look forward to sharing the final product with the board during the 2021-2022 school year. Before we conclude this update, I'd like to share with you some feedback that we collected from upperclassmen through the Roe Kappa Social Studies Honor Society. It was great to get their input on what they enjoy in the social studies department and what they believe could be improved upon moving forward. Along with that, they made some requests for classes to be offered in the future including AP Human Geography, which we will be offering during the 2021-2022 school year. Here are three upperclassmen, seniors Brianna Baugh, Peter Amendolora, and Anna Silver, to discuss their experiences with social studies at Oyster Bay High School. So what I enjoy about it is there's usually um, somewhere down the line a lot of group work. Things like I remember in World, we used to work in groups and go through different um, primary sources. That was something that, that I liked, how as groups we would interpret things historically using our own unique perspectives and using the historical lenses that our teachers taught us. And together we would come up with um, the context behind certain things. That's something that I liked about the social studies program a lot, was how every teacher seemed to be able to incorporate group work into their lessons and curriculums throughout the year, at multiple times in the I year. I really think that being a social studies student at and being a history major at, at Maris in the future, I really think that Oyster Bay Social Studies is truly a blessing to be inside. I mean, you have these very insightful teachers with Mr. Ponto and his in-depth analysis of everything. It makes everything so much easier. And then Mr. Soper with his humor and his engaging lessons. I feel like that 
those teachers definitely inspired me to continue learning history and made learning history so much fun. And that's why it, they inspire me to continue pursuing history in college. I feel like that what they taught me that they made me so interested in the content and the course material that not only was I able to ace the exams, I was able to keep memory of what I learned in the class. Like I can still tell you facts from pre-AP World with Mr. Brown because I love it so much and he made it so interesting. That's what I love about social studies and I always say that. So an experience that I really enjoyed in social studies was just learning about history and learning how the stories of different people around the world all came together and seeing the lineage between US history and other world histories. And uh, I would say that the social studies department doesn't really need any improvement because a lot of the teachers are really dedicated to the subjects they teach and they're very knowledgeable about them and are able to make it into a way that students are able to learn from them. I feel like this is not a, this is not a, a diss to anybody, but I really feel like we should offer more history courses. I mean, we could all, we should offer AP European history. I feel like AP European history is a it's a good elective for anyone who was very interested in AP world history and would like to continue learning about history outside the United States. I would like to see more of teachers connecting things that they already said to things that they're saying in the future, just to kind of solidify the idea that the teachers are the ones that are teaching. They don't just introduce, oh yeah, this, you need to study that in the chapter. I'll just talk about it once, but really it's up to you to do that. Thank you, Brianna, Anna, and Peter. Uh, your feedback and the feedback of all of those in Rho Kappa will help us reflect on next steps for the department. Before I end the presentation, I'd just like to share some of our wins through the years. This is in no way exhaustive, but really looks at some of the wonderful accomplishments we have had in the social studies department. We have had students reach the state competition for National History Day and the National Geographic Geography Bee. And recently, our sixth grade social studies team at James H. Vernon placed third in the National Current Events League competition. As a department, we have been doing great work and have shared that work with the island and the state through presentations at workshops and conferences. Finally, our teachers have been recognized for the great work they have been doing, including a Social Studies Elementary Teacher of the Year and a High School Social Studies Teacher of the Year. I am excited about where this department is at in terms of personnel and in terms of curriculum. While there is always room for improvement, I am confident that day in and day out, we have highly effective socialized teachers in every classroom at Oyster Bay. Over the past five years, we have grown as a department, and I hope the next five years continues to provide growth opportunities for our teachers, and more importantly, for our students. I'd like to thank the Board of Education, who has been nothing but supportive of the social studies department. Your attention to detail and support of curriculum initiatives is greatly appreciated. I'd also like to thank Dr. Yanni, who has brought such positive energy to Oyster Bay. I look forward to our first full year together in 2021-2022, and I look forward to his plans for the future in not only the social studies department, but the district. Thank you to Dr. Mohal for always providing her support and advice as we dove into curriculum changes, new regents exams, and shifts in instructional practices. Thank you to my colleagues, both, both administrators and teachers, who have come to, this, who come to this pearl of the North Shore every single day and inspire our students with their expertise and passion. Most importantly, thank you to the students. Their drive to be the best they can be has always been evident, but over the past 14 months, I have had, to, I had the opportunity to see their resilience. They are truly an inspiration. Thank you again for the opportunity to present here tonight and for your support of the Social Studies Department. I'll take any questions you may have at this time. Dr. Scarif, yeah. you, you are correct. Before your arrival here, uh, our social studies department was the weakest for the district. But with our, with our increased AP scores, we're embracing local history, uh, embracing competitions. It's become a, a strong point of the district. Um, but I do have a question. What, there was one class yeah. Human geography? AP human geography. Can you explain what that is? Sure. So AP human geography is really the study of, of how people have evolved and where they've settled. It's, it's a really interesting class. And the reason we're putting it in the ninth and 10th grade is you, you can connect it to world history to, to understand patterns of settlement. It's, um, 
some of our neighboring districts ha have started to, uh, to uh, implement it, and, and the response that they've gotten from their students is that they really enjoy the course. It's actually a course that they just love to, to, uh, to take, so we're hoping it takes off here. Thank you. Yep. I have a question. Yeah. Congratulations, Bob. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so when you talk about AP classes, human geography, you heard one of the students mention European history. You know, how many total AP courses are, are there? Are there eligible? And how do we go deciding that which we should add, how yeah. many more we should add? I mean, where are we at a saturation point yeah. at one time? Are we? That's know, always the, the concern. Process? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's, uh, that's always a concern. That's why we're, we're slow to implement new ones. I mean, the social studies department, this, that's going to be our fifth one. So we have AP World, AP US, AP Government, AP Psychology, and then AP Human Geo coming next year. Um, we feel like we're at a point now where there is that, uh, that, that desire from some students through, through some surveys we've done and some just discussions with students for another AP exam, uh, for another AP course, sorry. And um, you know, we thought the ninth and 10th grade area was the best place for that where they're not inundated with other APs in other classes. Um, yeah, we do get to a saturation level at some point and you know, we wanna be careful not to overload students. I think that's, that's the one thing we wanna be careful with that we don't you know, stress them out where they're taking, uh, you know, four or five AP exam, uh, AP courses and exams if they can't handle it. So we are just careful to ensure that as these enrollment numbers are being submitted, we're monitoring to see that students, uh, you know, aren't being stretched, stretched too thin. Um, but we do see, especially in social studies, as I, as I showed you, uh, enrollment numbers are very high and we're, we're proud of that. We, we, we like to give students that opportunity. And as long as they're willing to uh, give the effort, I think that they learn a lot in those social studies classes, even if, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a struggle early on to build up that, uh, that endurance to get to that AP level work. Great, thank you. I, I must say it's a glowing testament to see some of the students say, you know, really make it interesting. I love it so much. I mean, that, that is really fantastic to see. Yeah. So great job. We have great students here. I mean, that's no doubt about that. Yeah, I, I would just like to echo the remark regarding the AP scores. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I had two students in this high school, very few students did well on the AP um, world, and now our scores are remarkable. Um, I think it brings an enthusiasm and it encourages kids to take the class. And we, I just think, you know, you working with Dr. Mohall has done a tremendous job, and I just want to thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Anyone else? Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you so it. Much, Thank Dr. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Buscaro. Great job. Okay, on to uh, approval of minutes. Um, look for the workshop meeting on 4621 and the workshop meeting on 42021. Motion? So moved. Second? Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? <laughs> Motion carries. And now on to Dr. Yanni for the business, sure. the, uh, business and facilities report. Yep. Um, thank you. And um, I just want to give an update on where we are in terms of our facilities. And, and just discuss with the community uh, a, little, a little bit of what we are, uh, what we have been, and what we plan to be. I think it's important, just like you, um, just like when you look at your own home and you look at the, the house that you have, the property that you have, to look at that property and really look at, take a, a proactive look and not wait for things to happen in order to make any uh, adjustment. I think it's important. And I think as a district, as a community, uh, it is important that we look at our facilities and, and say um, where we are right now and what we could be uh, in the future. Uh, it was very, uh, did a little bit of uh, work in terms of um, our schools and, you know, impressive that um, the high school was built in 1929. And when you look at the high school and the location of the high school and where it's located right, right, uh, uh, on the waterfront, basically, um, 
you could see the, 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 the amount of maintenance that takes a school like this with the amount of bricks and, and everything, the windows and facility and everything that we have uh, to maintain that, that facility in top, in top condition. Um, so you see that it was built in 1929. Uh, Vernon was built in 1955. And we have Roosevelt, uh, that it was a little after that, I think uh, around 960. So when we look at the facility, uh, there is a, a very simple document that is called the Building Condition Survey Report that we have to submit to, to the state by law every five years. And that, that number is pretty much consistent. That what that, that report will do, um, will, will, it's, it's almost like a, a checkup for the building that we have. So we have the architectural firm uh, that we have, uh, custodials, a head custodial, myself, uh, the assistant superintendent for business, assistant superintendent for curriculum. We walk around the building and the, 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 the building, um, the architectural firm walk around the building and they look at every single detail. So that document uh, that is filed with the state it's pretty much a, a five-year plan and looks at everything. Looks at whatever, what, what's up to code, uh, what needs to be, what, in, what is in good working condition, what needs to be done. And it is important to look at that survey because that's a, that's a way to, to kind of be proactive and see what what needs to be taken care of before it becomes because before it becomes a problem there is also healthy and safety uh coded items uh codes that need to be um that need to be addressed so sometimes when you take a classroom and you divide that classroom you need to have a proper ventilation or if you have let's say windows um exposed to you know near near the waterfront you see the salt or the corrosion, you want to make sure that you stay on top of that, or even inside the amount of plaster that we have in the building, uh, and, and stay on top of that. And what we do, we look at the budget every year, and you're trying to find a balance, just like a home. Uh, you built your house, and then year after year, you have the use, and then sometimes you call the painter, and then you go through that. And then you renovate the kitchen. Then once you're done renovating the kitchen, then you think about the living room, and you say, well, now that looks uh, something that needs to be renovated. And then you're looking at the electrical, and, and that needs to be updated. So all of that is built into the budget. But when you look at the budget, right, uh, one item that is very, very critical is that debt service line. So sometimes from year to year we have uh, bond that have been issued, capital projects that have been issued, because those projects, they cannot be included all at once inside the budget. The budget will go through the roof. So what you do, you build a little bit at a time when you can, and then once in a while when the rate is at the right time, when you have an interest rate that is... Um, at, the, uh, at a low level, or you have work that needs to be done, a large amount of work that needs to be done, you create sort of a, a capital project, a debt service. And so one of the first things that I've done since my beginning here at Arista Bay East Norwich was to look at the debt service analysis. And look at that debt service analysis. We discussed this during the budget presentation, and if you look, you will see that the, the, the debt service uh, line is part of that eight-point calculation that is, um, the eight-part calculation that, is, that we use to calculate the allowable tax levy. So just like we did the budget right now, we worked on the budget, the allowable tax levy limit was a 1.4. But that calculation was based on a debt, debt service, a line that we have that is part of that calculation of $2.1 million. That is an important line in, in our calculation of the budget because that's part of one of the steps that, that we have to follow. So one of the things that I noticed 
at the beginning, as soon as I um, start my superintendent uh, of a year, is that we have some debt service that is coming off. So just like I use the example of the home, uh, sometimes when you have, uh, you're leasing a car, for example, um, you see that that lease is coming off, so you have to make a decision. And so you see the payments, and then you see at one point our payments will come off. And then you have to make the right decision. Do I drive, or do I continue to drive to work, or do I walk, or do I take the bicycle to work? Those are all decisions that you have to make when that debt service is falling off. So this slide is pretty much showing you some of the major projects that we that the district had over a number of years. And this is the last four years. So you will see on this slide, if you look at the total debt service, which is the last row at the bottom, you will see that you have a payment in 2021 of 2,328, which was part of our calculation. And that allowed us to have an allowable tax levy of 1.4. Uh, next year, you'll see a 21-22 school year, 2.3 million, pretty much consistent. Then you see 22-23, there is a payment of 2,252,000. And then when you see something very interesting, in 23-24, that payment goes down to $522,000. So you see that the first reaction to this, when you see a drop in numbers like that, the first reaction is, let me check that I plug the right numbers in, that I did the right calculation. So I did that, and then the answer was yes, the numbers were correct. And then I started asking uh, board members and previous board members, um, what was the project that was coming off? And when you look at that project, there is a two million, there is a bond principal, bond interest, uh, energy performance contract that was done. The biggest one was what we are currently right now the renovation of the library, which used to be gymnasium, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was probably still in Italy then, right? <laughs> uh, and the creation of the uh, gymnasium and the entire area above the, um, uh, the entire gym um, on the side. So this was renovated into a library and all the rooms in the back. So you see that that project was put in place the community created a bond, they went for a bond, uh, capital project, so now it's coming off. So when you look at that difference, okay, you're looking at a difference between is going from a, a payment that you have, so picture you leasing a car, okay? You have a payment, it's a very expensive car, $2.2 .2 million, but you're going from 2.2 to 5522. So there is a drop in the, in the debt service of 1729 And one of the things that I did for the community to see, and we're gonna post this on a separate web page because I like the community just to, to analyze those numbers and see in full transparency what we're dealing with. That's the calculation with the uh, first year when we did a, a 1.4 the levy that we had this year. So we did the eight step calculation and we used our first number of $2.3 million. You're looking at the future, right? Now I'm looking at next year. Uh, what you see in yellow is the calculation considering that every number will stay the same. So that the uh, tax levy growth factor will stay the same, CPI will stay the same. Considering all of that, now, we are projecting for the future. And you see that that payment, it's still that the levy that you see is at about 1.45, which is the number right next to 1.4. If I go one more year, and that's the year when the debt service comes off, you see that the levy at that point, it comes to a negative number because now you have that debt service that is not being calculated. It is not part of that calculation. It's a smaller number. So you're going from a $2.2 million to 
and $22,000. So that calculation will come out to be negative. So some people, I, I usually, that was one of the, my first movie that I watched when I learned the English language. Houston, we have a problem because when you have a negative levy, you can look at that as a problem and as an opportunity, right? So the, the problem that you have with a negative levy is that you are creating a fluctuation in your levy that is very, very tough to overcome over a number of years. So you, you can look at this and say, okay, my tax are gonna go up by 1.4, 1.45, and then all of a sudden they're gonna drop by a negative one point, they're gonna drop by 1.5. So you see that that could be a tremendous problem because you have a fluctuation. So the following year they can go up again. So that's one problem. Avoid the, the fluctuation. Any financial advisor will tell you that when you have that kind of fluctuation in the levy, it's problematic for multiple reasons. One of them is the fact that you have a drop and then an increase. The second problem is that if you decide to do any type of work later on, because the work needs to be done, so the, 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 the maintenance of, of the facility needs to be done, needs to be, the facility needs to be maintained, when you have that, what you will end up, you will end up with a levy that is gonna go right through the roof for multiple reasons. One, you're gonna add a debt service. Uh, once you add a negative, then you add, so they could go up to four, five percent, uh, number one. And number two, the cost of any work that you do two years, three years from now, could be tremendous for multiple reasons. One, the cost of material, two, labor and all of that. But the other piece is the interest rate. And right now we have uh, interest rates uh, that they are very, very low, almost unusually low, I would say, right, Marianne? Um, so what is the opportunity? Every time you look at a problem, you say, okay, we have a problem. We're gonna end up with a negative levy if we just sit still. What is the opportunity over here? Well, opportunity number one is what if we create a new debt service to maintain, to avoid the fluctuation in the levy. That's one, that's one tremendous opportunity. And, and so we have to really think as a community, um, the, the, the facility that we have, the improvement that we have made, that you have made, the investment that you have done. If you look at this beautiful building, and you look at the music uh, wing, the music department, you look at that wing, it, it's almost like very hard to believe that that was an add-on because the, the community supported our bond, the community uh, really, the district really looked at the project and they were meticulous in the design, in the implementation of, of the work that it was done. So we have to look at every problem and create an opportunity because at the end of the day, we need to continue to provide our students with the best possible options that we can that we can we can give them. And given the fact that the interest rate rate right now is so low, we really got to look at the numbers and analyze and say, can we get can we let this wonderful opportunity go by? Um, so what if we create a potential new bond? And so. What if we do that? Well, there are a couple of things that we're gonna solve. One problem is we will avoid by putting a same debt service on, right? We will avoid a fluctuation in our levy. So in other words, we can put a same bond, continue with the same thing, continue with the same payment, and the community will feel no change in their levy. Mm -hmm. That's tremendous. The second point, the second problem that we, we solved, I usually use the word solved because when I used to teach mathematics, solved was like check, I finished, I checked. 
So solved, the second solved problem is that we did, uh, we, we, we did a calculation, projected calculation. Again, those are projections. Things can go up, way up or way low, but projection based on the, on the past. We did the projection and we saw that if you decide to do work in 26, 27, which is possible, it's a couple of years from now, your levy will go up to a 5%. Now think about this. We have an increase of 1.4, which is within the limit, and we had roughly about $1.1 million, 700 from, from budget to budget. So when you look at when you look at a 5% levy, that would be a tremendous problem. That would be a tremendous problem because that will have an impact on programs. There is no way a community can afford a 5% nowadays and not look at pro programs that, that we have in school. So those are the problems. The, the interesting thing about this community, and um, I'm very proud to be part of it and proud to be the superintendent of this district, is that this is nothing new. You have done this analysis before. You have done this thinking before. So I'm not bringing anything. Uh, I feel bad because I always want to bring something completely new. But this, this time, I'm not bringing anything new to the table. The district have looked at that service coming off, presented, uh, shared with the community, and, and moved on. So the, 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 the question at that point uh, is very simple. The question is, I need to put $2.2 million on, 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 the, on, the, on the line to maintain, to avoid the fluctuation in tax. So what kind of bond would allow me to have a debt service line of $2.2 million? So we did a, a little bit of work with that. And when you look at that, that difference, in order to have, if you look at the first table on top, if you look at a debt service of $2.2 million, the community can afford, without a change in a penny, a change in taxes, can afford a, a new capital project um, of in the range of $30 million. That would be a 15-year uh, uh, bond, uh, the interest uh, estimated at this point is about 1.5 is very low. Uh, but in order to have that kind of debt service, um, the community can afford to have a project on multiple schools of $30 million. Um, when, you look at the, when you look at the payment, that payment would be sort of consistent with what we have been doing. And so the, the, the natural question is, if, if we present a, a, a project, a capital project uh, in the range of $30 million, and, and you see that schools, even surrounding schools, have done the same thing because of the interest is so low at this point, and there's always a, a look at what's next, looking at the, the levy, the positive levy, and negative levy. When you look at the scope of work, we have looked at multiple things. One, we looked at the building condition survey. Number two, we looked at the schools today and say what the school should look like 15, 20 years from now. Because you want to do project, you want to do work just like you do in your house. You don't want to build a living room that is going to work for a year or two. You want to create a living room that is going to be there 15 years from now, 20 years from now, and it's going to be still... Um, you know, useful. Uh, and, and so what are some of the work that we, we looked at, that we investigated, that we investigated and we kind of brainstorm a little bit? So just going by school, and again, those are just ideas that we had because we would like to share this and, and, and start a conversation with, with the community and, and hopefully have a meaningful conversation and say what we need, what our students need, and how can we, can we achieve that? So when you look at the high school, um, that's a beautiful high school, and uh, this is so nice because the, the Google, Earth, Google Earth is a wonderful thing. It's becoming my best friend. 
So you look at the high school, that's the tennis courts in the back, the library and the renovation. One of the, the overall scope of that work for the high school is twofold. One is in the library, this work was done, but all the back offices over here, uh, they were pretty much untouched a little bit. So the idea would be on the left side to renovate the inside of this, this, uh, this area um, and, and create in the back of the library where, where we are over here and look at create a, a, a renovation of, of that area almost to create a, uh, an innovation lab. So what students and where we've learned during the COVID is the fact that students are uh, not learning and 10, 15 years from now is gonna be even different. They're not learning the typical way. They're not learning in the typical format where a teacher's in front of the classroom, they're sitting in a row and, and they learn by collaborating, by investigating. So when you look at an innovation lab, when you're looking at a picture, of, for example, like a, like a, a store where you have students and working with, with, tech, with the technology department, um, student working on AP courses, investigating, brainstorming together, collaborating with each other, doing video conferencing, so that entire room would be renovated with that in mind. The idea would be to create a, a, a classroom for that is 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we look at it and say, wow, we were way ahead of the game uh, and, and start that renovation. So that entire area in the back of the library would be renovated. And again, those are just initial thinking because the next step uh, would be to discuss with the community the idea and then start putting details on, on paper. So we, we're imagining uh, a window, a rounding window in the front, and then the back, all students working, workstations for students, teachers, and, and collaboration. Coding has been programming, broadcasting. Those are, those are the things of the future, uh, giving, giving the students all the opportunities possible. The second piece is, the second area of renovation would be on the second floor. We have three rooms right in pretty much center of the building. Uh, one of them, uh, I believe, used to be a, a library in the past. So that would be a renovation where students can, we can open up the space, creating a broadcasting uh, studio and a classroom of, of the future. Same concept, same idea, where students can, can really make that a, a learning center. Uh, and that would be a, a way for for our students and for our teachers, for presenters, uh, to do work, to collaborate, and, and to, to work on, on projects that are just not just classroom projects. They go outside uh, of, the, of the classroom. So that when you look at that area, the center is the auditorium and you see all the balcony. So that would be in the back, which is right in the front of the building. We will open up one space, the, the two classroom, create one uh, area, uh, maintain the, 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 that off. There is an office that uh, is uh, almost historical in terms of the woodwork that is there. So incorporate that into the design of those rooms um, and, and create that, that, uh, that new center. The board has walked through these areas, uh, so some of these ideas, but again, those are rough ideas without, without details at this point. The next piece is the, this is the back. So when you look at the, uh, when you look at the high school, you see that that's the field that we have in the back, and I think would be uh, a tremendous uh, help to have um, a turf field at the high school uh, that will create a, a space for uh, football, for soccer, field hockey, girls lacrosse, softball. Um, so that would be that. That will put a nice touch to to our high school facility. Um, we you have seen the work at the uh, at Vernon, uh, the high school. 
and the, the turf at the at Vernon. Uh, so you see that a turf at the high school would, would just uh, uh, put, put, our, put our athletic department and our facility to the next level. Uh, when you look at James Vernon High School, uh, middle school, should say three to six, not even a middle school. So you have uh, you have the beautiful school. Um, there are several projects over here that we have in mind. Uh, so when you look at their cafeteria, music, renovation of classroom, the Butler Building, and uh, storage facility. So when you look at the um, renovation of the music wing and classroom, where those rooms are, um, those are the, the current basketball court right now, basketball court and playground. So this is as you enter the building, facing the building to the left. So that will allow us to have a uh, music, um, an entire music wing, and also in green, you see a renovation of some of the classroom to allow for more space. Uh, one, one, one thing that we learned with COVID, our students learn, our students work with each other. Uh, so to allow that space and you know, obviously renovate some of the areas. This is the current uh, music wing. Um, that would be renovated uh, with classrooms and uh, students uh, with students center um, that would be minor renovation but again uh, would require some some additional work when you look at the uh, butler building which is at the end it's a, it's a building that went up so this would be a complete renovation of that area and stretch um, you see in a building like uh, vernon you have students three to six uh, there is there is uh, there is definitely a need for students. Um, we call it we can call it cafetorium, where you have a cafeteria or an auditorium or space that is used, and that that space is also used by our um, high school, some of our high school athletes. So that would be that building would be completely renovated on the inside, um, and one of the the top part is right now currently used as a storage, so that would be a complete renovation of that entire uh, building. Uh, storage facility will be added next to, uh, to the uh, current uh, building that we have uh, when you walk to, to the turf field. And the last renovation would be the current cafeteria. It would be a little bit of an extension and inside renovation of that cafeteria. Uh, my understanding is that cafeteria is still original, which is great, but maybe it's time to upgrade a little bit. When you look at Theodore Roosevelt, um, Theodore Roosevelt School has grown, and, and sometimes when you, look at the, when you look at the population, when you look at the number, you look at our enrollment, you may not see all that change, but what has changed is the um, unfunded mandate from the state and the requirements in terms of student service. So when you look at numbers, you would say, well, there's not much of an increase that would dictate uh, extension of that building. But when you look at the service that we have to provide by law, you could see that there is a need for space. And if you walk around the building, uh, the board had an opportunity to visit, like they do every year. Uh, there are there is a lot of spaces that the, the the building and the building principal have been very creative, uh, but some work can be done. So when you look at the when you look at the building, again you see that uh, the memorial field is to the right. Um, so you'll see that um, the work that we are proposing over here is the extension of the, um, I would call it the, 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 the north part of the building, I would say, no, uh, south, right? So when you look at the building, the bottom would be the front of the building, so that would be an extension, would be a two-story um, extension uh, that would allow us uh, to have a total of 
e-classroom plus uh, additional, additional space. So when you look at uh, by floor, this would be the first floor, so you see the eighth classroom, the support space, um, obviously uh, all, all the different, you know, the staircase and closets and, and all of that. That would be the first floor. And that would be the uh, pretty much uh, the second floor, which would be similar to that, and obviously they don't have the exit to, to, to the ground. So that would be uh, work uh, that, that we are proposing over there. So when we look by building, uh, just to quickly summarize, you have Innovation Lab by the library at the high school, the turf and 21st century classrooms. You look at Vernon, you have the music wing, the renovation of the Butler building, the ground storage, and the cafeteria and the room renovation. And then when you look at Roosevelt, you have the building extension with eight classrooms and learning uh, space. Um, in terms of timeline, and, and that's, I think that is the most critical section of this presentation, I would say. Because when you look at the timeline, when I, when I share this with the board and I kind of project, plan that out, right? What we have, we have a, a, a critical, um, we are at a critical point. And the point is that right now, in order for us to be successful, in putting uh, into the budget a, date, a debt service that would allow to maintain the same levy and avoid that fluctuation, we are in a very tight uh, timeline. In other words, we need to have, if, we, if the community supports this idea, right, we need to have a, a vote um, that is gonna come in December and that would allow us to put boots on the ground in the summer of 2022. If we miss that timeline, right, what will happen is by the time we get all the approval from the state and, and everything else, that debt service is going to come off. And once it comes off, it will defeat the purpose of having the, the debt service right at the uh, end of the previous one. So when you look at the timeline, uh, typically when long-term debt issue, uh, principal and interest rate in the following fiscal year, so we need to issue bonds during the 22-23 school year to backfill the debt that is falling off. So in other words, if it comes off, and then you let it go a little bit, and then you put it on, it will defeat the purpose of, of doing this. But if you put it right at the end of the previous one, then it will work. As a result, we have a one-time opportunity to create learning spaces that our students deserve with no additional expense. And I, I can't emphasize this enough uh, because when you look at the when you look at the work and you look at the 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 uh, talking to the financial advisor, uh, this is definitely an opportunity that is um, that would be tremendous for for all our students, not just the high school and and the uh, Roosevelt students or, or or the Vernon student. This would be an improvement to to our facility, to our community, and. You know, it's, it's like when you're home, you, you want to have a wonderful home, so when the kids come home, they're proud of bringing their friends home, and that's how I look at it all the time. Uh, we have a, we're gonna post a, a, a timeline that we, uh, we had planned that I had an opportunity to discuss with the board. We're gonna continue to have this presentation. Um, I hope that, you know, we, we post, um, we send, several blasts, but I would love nothing more than to talk to community members, to talk to different organizations, um, however you think would be the best way for me to, to share the message and for me and obviously the board and my team to, to talk about the benefit and to look at things that maybe we didn't think of because right now um, we're trying to brainstorm and, and try to look from 
from a financial perspective, from a, a student perspective, teacher perspective, and, and also looking, looking at the future. I'm gonna post this timeline that we have. Uh, this is, you know, I call it tentative timeline because nothing is set in stone. The board has seen this um, as, a, as a part of their preview to, to the board meeting, but this has not been set in stone. This is literally um, uh, us, my team, looking at, looking at the numbers, looking at the books and say, hey, what can we do to be proactive, to give the students the best and empowering them so they can achieve excellence? And I um, wanna thank you and I wanna open up if you have any questions or um, questions for me. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yanni. Yeah. Um, it does seem like this is a, a great time because of interest rates. It's probably one of the lowest interest rates we've had in a long time and we can improve our facilities you borrowing money at such a low interest rate. Um, it seems very interesting. I think we also saw that during the pandemic, our schools are do need more space. Mm -hmm. um, it was very difficult to spread out our students. Um, we've got students in some very small classrooms, so I think it, it, that's also very interesting. Um, the question I have for you is, if this bond, we, we put it up for vote in December and it's passed, at what time can you lock in those interest rates to make sure that we get the, the lowest interest in case things start rising in the near future? So um, when you have, if, let's say we follow this timeline, right? Uh, you will put boots on the ground on the summer of 2022. At that point, you will not go f for the full bond, right? You will go for bands. Um, bond, bond anticipated notes, um, so you can lock some lock some of the uh, the interest uh, on that end. But I think the the full bond it will go into 22, 23, 23, 24 will be on the book. First right? payment would be in 23, 24, mm -hmm. and we can finance as soon as we get SED approval. That's that's what we need in order to get financing. SED approval on, on a project or, or. And once you get SED approval, can you still lock in that interest rate for that bond? Or yes. You well, can? We lock it in for the ban. So the bond anticipation note would mm -hmm. come first. And then as you get more SED approvals, you would turn that bond into, that ban into a bond at a certain point when you hit a certain level of mm -hmm. expenditure. So, so we have to. But you it. don't have to structure it with a ban. So, I mean, you could. You you have alternatives to structure it as a direct you know as a bond without using the ban if you feel that rates are going to go up because you know everything you hear from the Fed is that 2023 is the magic year where rates are probably going to mm -hmm. go up right. so we probably should try to lock in a fixed rate for 15 years you know before that and maybe structure it without a bond anticipation note it's just in my opinion mm -hmm. that's probably what I would speak to the advisor about. Um, but, you know, we could certainly have conversations about that. But how long does it take to get SED approval? I mean, it varies. It really depends on, you know, is it uh, plumbing, engineering, um, electrical. Any project that involves that takes a lot longer to get approved. But something like a turf field that doesn't have plumbing or electrical, I, I assume we're not gonna have lights on the field, mm -hmm. um, would be a much quicker approval. And a project like that would be one that we would do probably as one of the first projects because it would have the quickest SED approval time. Yeah, a lot of times there's a structure with bans if you're not gonna spend the proceeds immediately because you have a certain period of time on a tax exempt financing to spend the proceeds. But you do have a three year time frame as, as long as that's your reasonable expectation. So hopefully we can lock in to a lower rate sooner rather than later. Um, I think, Marianne, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it probably, to, to answer your question, Ms. Kowalski, probably the earliest time would be the summer of 20, summer of 22. That's the earliest time that you can lock some either bands or bonds, Not, nothing, Nothing earlier than that because you have two major issues. Number one is the vote, uh, and number two, 
the SED approval and once you schedule the projects, you're looking at a bond like this, a capital project like this, you will look probably at a two phase, maybe three phases. Phase one would be the one that you will get quicker turnaround. Turf field, some inside work. We have about probably 1.2, 1.3 million dollar in from the building condition survey. We have been analyzing that. So you're dealing with roughly turf field, dealing with, because that's a quick turnaround design and approval, and then you're dealing with um, internal work that doesn't require plumbing, electrical. So interest, interest rate, probably that's the earliest time to lock it. Even for, so even for the turf field, the earliest time you think is the summer of 2022? Mm -hmm. Summer 22, not earlier than that, because so December, if, if we follow this timeline, December of December 20, December 2021 would be the bond vote. That will give the green light um, with a successful vote with a gre green light to design and submit to the state. Probably four to six weeks turnaround. Mm -hmm. So then at that point, you get the SED approval, you go for a for bid, um, you go out to bid, probably a word within a month, May, June, July, boots on the ground. Okay, and what about the, the rest of the bond then? So then the rest of the bond, while you're doing that, what you're doing, you you uh, start the, cre the, the planning for the other work. So then you're looking at uh, the design, you're looking at all the approval, so that will take longer time. So as they design the turf field, right, in the spring of 22, what you will do, you will start the designing, working, because obviously at that point you will do internal work. So picking e everything, the color, the doors, mm -hmm. the shape, everything, electrical, technical, everything. So you will start the design in the spring of 22, and probably that will go all the way until October, November, probably December, submit to the state, three, four months turn around, then you are at the summer of 23. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're, the concern is that the design couldn't be completed for the SED to approve it mm -hmm. before that time. So you would most likely with, with the uh, a project like the biggest project, Vernon and uh, Roosevelt, you're dealing with probably the completion of the design and the submitting to the state. I would, I would talk to BBS, but I, based on my experience, I don't think anything before September, October of 2022. Yeah, okay. so the, the purpose of the bond anticipation note is for the expenditures for the design, right. before and you have the SED and approval, also to have that right? Turf field and also the turf, so that and we have turf. that one payment to keep the tax levy. Yeah. So the the key the key is to put that payment, to put that payment on, to put that payment in the book. So when we design the 22-23 budget, that payment goes on, so there is no drop into into that line. So it's really the design that's holding it up. Design and the, uh, well, SED the cost. Approval. Yes, SED approval, the cost of the turf. Okay. So altogether, you need, basically, if you think about it, if we have a 522, um, and you need about 2.2 to keep the same, you need about a million seven in expense that needs to, be on the book, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a shame that we couldn't get the design in sooner so that we could lock the rate sooner. Mm -hmm. That would be really the m optimal approach. Yeah, if, if I know it's not typical, but. Yeah, it's if you think about the turf field design uh, and work inside, it will not require a lot of time, but if you think about December, January, February, probably March by the time they put it up, February and, you know, you need March, April. 
I think that would be the timeline, but uh, definitely something that our, our, our main question uh, to the architectural firm was, can we put, can we have all the paperwork and the bidding and everything in time for summer 22? If we can do earlier, that would be even better. But again, at that point, you, you're looking at construction, you're looking at you know, the school and the impact on the school, so that if it's done during the summer, July, August, maybe September, the field would be ready to go. Any other question? Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Young. Um, that was a very interesting presentation. And hopefully you'll be giving it to the PTAs and the PTA councils, things like that. Okay. I will start the conversation, and um, we will continue on June 8th to give more details. But hopefully um, any community member, I'd like to just share the same presentation and go over so we can talk about it and hear feedback. I think it's important that we're all on the same page. Summer is coming, so a lot of people hopefully go on vacation and things are getting better. So it's important to, to keep talking. We want to make sure that the community understands the, the opportunity that we have. Thank okay. you. Okay, on to um, personnel actions. And this goes down to page, let's just see where it goes to. It goes to page four. Um, Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District hereby approves the following professional personnel and civil service personnel resolutions as listed. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. On to budget adoption. Resolved, the Board of Education certifies the tallies of the annual meeting as recorded by the district clerk dated May 18, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? I just want to congr congratulate Nora, who is joining her first um, Board of Ed meeting tonight. So welcome. Um, all in favor? Aye. All Aye. opposed? Motion carries. Business actions resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District hereby approves the following business resolutions as listed. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Special services resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District hereby approves the following special services resolutions as listed. Do so I have a moved. motion? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. New business. Resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District hereby approves the following new business resolutions as listed. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Can you continue to say for the, um, for a second, Board of Education Association? Okay. I'm all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Okay, I think that is, and move on to, I don't know what it is, discussion or Friday packet. Any questions on the Friday yeah, packet? I, I just had a question on the Friday packet, and it was also part of the correspondence. Um, so the music department choir major seemed seem to be 
not optimal for the students. And I, I guess I just wanted to discuss that, the possibilities mm -hmm. that we have there. I, in the Friday packet too, there was a discussion like regarding the choir merger um, and the fact that um, the students, you know, there wasn't enough enrollment, right? I mean, we don't have to discuss it tonight if if you want to, you know, look at the data and maybe come back. Well, we we did look at the data, and the part of the issue is with some smaller numbers next year, it creates, um, we usually would have a concert choir and the chamber singers. And so when w those groups are so small, you don't have full, like a full bass section or a full section and it makes it a bit more challenging. So we did make the decision for next year to merge the two with the hope that we'll be bringing back both of them, that this is not a permanent, um, you know, status for the two choirs. Do we, like, know where the impact to, from a music perspective, like, you know, it, d it just seemed like from the correspondence and, you know, the parents are, are just not thinking it's an optimal situation. I understand enrollment is down. But we've run programs before with APs that had enrollment down because we want to provide the best Absolutely. support, obviously. So I was just wondering why in this case maybe we were not supporting the two choirs separately. I guess I, the best analogy I could give would be um, if you don't have enough to run the JV team, you're merging the two. So I think it's more of a situation like that because you have been very generous with all kinds of courses, especially when we're trying to start programs. Um, so it wasn't that we had such low numbers that we were afraid we weren't going to meet the 12. It's just that to give that full choir or choral experience as opposed to like a small ensemble experience. So it just changes it. So they would be like two smaller ensembles rather than choirs. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions on Friday packet? Okay, do we have a, uh, a motion to adjourn the meeting? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone at home for participating. Good night. 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 Everybody.